Okay, so the second part of the notes, we're going to be talking about fossils, which I think is pretty interesting. So fossils are the preserved remains or traces of an organism that lived in the past. Fossils provide important evidence of how life and environmental conditions have changed. So fossils are going to give us clues about genetic diversity of organisms, about past climate of the earth, and changes that have occurred within organisms over time, which is what the whole second half of our evolution unit is going to be on, changes in organisms. But for right now, we're just going to focus on fossil types. We have six main fossil types, mold fossils, cast fossils, petrified fossils, preserved fossils, carbonized fossils, and traced fossils. Each of these fossil types is classified based on how the fossil was formed. So first, talking about mold fossils, these form when sediments bury an organism and the sediments change into rock. The organism then decays, which just leaves a cavity in the shape of an organism. So I like to think about these um, as like an ice cube tray. So the mold fossil would be the ice cube tray. So you have the shape of the ice cube, but no ice itself. So in these two pictures, we have the shape or the imprint of a fish, but the, all of the um, pieces of the fish have since decayed. Here we have a mold fossil or a cavity in the shape of a shell, but since that shell formed the cavity, this shell has decayed. So we have no remains of the actual organism. We just have a hole in the shape of that organism or a mold in the shape of that organism. Our second type of fossil is a cast fossil. This forms when we start off with a mold fossil that is then filled up with sand or mud that hardens into the shape of the organism. So this might look like bones or it might look like the organism itself, but it does not have any living remains. There's no remains of the actual organism. It's basically just rock in the shape of that organism. So if we're thinking about an ice cube tray as the mold fossil, we fill it up with water and freeze it, the actual ice cube would be like the cast fossil. Um, I know that one of the days that we talked about fossils in class, I passed around my trilobite fossil, which looks like this, that I keep on my desk. That is not an actual trilobite. No part of that trilobite is in the fossil. It's just a rock, essentially, in the shape of a trilobite. So mold fossils are a hole in the shape of the organism. Cast fossil is a mold fossil filled up with rock, basically. Okay, our third type of fossil is a petrified fossil. I think these are really pretty. So these form when minerals soak into buried remains, replacing the remains and changing them into rock. So this is a petrified or a picture of petrified wood. Um, so it looks still to be in the shape of a tree trunk, right? Like on the edges, you can see kind of where the bark would be. We still can kind of see some rings in here. There is no part of the actual living tree left over. This is all just stone in the shape of a tree. So petrified fossils are made from minerals that soak into the cells, into the remains of whatever organism we're thinking about. And then all of those cells, all of the living parts of that organism decay. And all we're left with are the minerals that soaked into the original organism. Preserved fossils or original remains, these are fossils of organisms' actual bodies and body parts. These are very, very rare. We don't have a lot um, of preserved fossils in the world. So these are usually found in airtight or small spaces where decay hasn't happened in order to prevent decay. There's three main substances that we can find preserved fossils in. The first one is ice. Um, in just a minute, I'll show you a slide with a frozen woolly mammoth body that was found in Siberia. Um, it was stored in ice, so there's still some bones, some muscles, some skin, and hair left on that organism, which is pretty interesting. Um, our second type of substance that we can find preserved fossils in is amber. Um, this is tree sap or resin, which is really sticky. It comes out of trees, kind of like syrup, um, and we'll find oftentimes some type of insect that has been trapped in the amber. The amber then hardens into stone and the organism is left inside of the amber. They have a lot of these at the Science Museum in North Carolina, if you've ever been there. Um, they sell some amber jewelry, if you've ever seen that. And then our third type of substance that we can find preserved fossils in is tar. So animals can get trapped in pools of tar and then they are preserved. So the picture that I'm gonna show you is of a saber-toothed tiger skull that was found in a tar pit 
Um, I think in California, if I'm remembering correctly, so let's look at those pictures. Here we have the woolly mammoth that was found in ice. Here we have an insect that was found in amber. And here we have the saber-toothed tiger skull that was found in tar. So again, this is the actual organism, the actual body parts of these organisms that have been stored in one of those three substances, ice, amber, or tar. Our fifth type of fossil is carbon film. This forms when organisms or parts of organisms are pressed between layers of soft mud or clay, which then hardens, and it squeezes almost all of the decaying organism away, which just leaves a carbon imprint on the rock. So this is kind of similar to a mold fossil in that we don't have the actual organism, we just have an imprint of it, but it isn't an actual cavity. It's just an imprint of the organism. Carbon films are um, really important for scientists because they show details of soft parts that we can't really see in other types of fossils. So if we think about um, like the wings of a butterfly or the flowers of a petal in the case of this picture, those soft parts decay much faster than the hard parts. So a lot of times in the other fossil types, we don't really see the soft parts. So carbon films are really special because they can show us those soft parts that we don't really see in the other types of fossils. Our last type of fossil is a trace fossil. Evidence of an organism's presence, such as footprints, trails, animal holes, are what consist of trace fossils or what we classify as trace fossils. These form when the mud or sand that had the print hardens into stone. So in this first picture, we see little feet prints of some type of organism just walking away. Um, they were probably walking through some type of mud, which then hardened. So we were left with their imprints of their feet. Here, it looks like we might have, um, to me it kind of looks like a motorcycle tire, but maybe it's a snake of some sort or something that um, had a tail that it dragged behind itself. Um, but again, we have evidence of an organism, but no actual pieces of the organism or no holes in the shape of the organism, just evidence that that organism existed. When we think about our fossil record, we have collected and studied millions of fossils. We have lots and lots of fossils that have been found in the world that scientists have put together to create the fossil record. The fossil record gives us important information about past life and environments on Earth. Certain fossilized organisms could only live in specific environments or under particular climate conditions and extinction of life forms, as well as how and when new life forms appeared as part of the fossil record. So we have all of these fossils. We can lay these fossils out in order from oldest to youngest. We can see when new organisms appeared. We can see when certain organisms went extinct. Um, we can see what types of environments these organisms lived in or maybe what the climate conditions were like. So the fossil record gives, them, gives us some really important information about the history of Earth. Index fossils are organisms that lived only during a short part of Earth's history. They are generally found um, in rock layers over a wide area of the Earth. So if we think about, um, let's say, North and South America, if we find trilobites, which is a good example of an index fossil, and a layer of Earth in North America and a layer of Earth in South America, scientists can pretty much assume that those two rock layers happened around the same time in Earth's history because trilobites only lived for a very short amount of time. So if we have trilobites in a rock layer in North America and trilobites in a rock layer in South America, chances are those rock layers formed around the same time. Um, trilobites, you have seen the fossil in my classroom. These organisms lived in shallow seas. They became extinct 245 million years ago and they are only found in certain rock layers, so they can be used to determine the age of fossils around them. So if we know they became extinct 245 million years ago, and in the same rock layer we have an organism that we have never seen before, we know that that organism had to have been alive at least 245 million years ago, because that's when trilobites were alive. It couldn't be any sooner um, or any more in the recent past because trilobites weren't alive then, so they wouldn't form in the same rock layer or at the same time. Okay, our last slide is about absolute dating. 
Absolute age um, is the absolute age of an event or object just her, excuse me, determined through radioactive dating. So when we think about our fossil record, when we think about different types of fossils, index fossils, we refer to that as relative dating. So we know about when those organisms existed. But absolute dating, we can use radioactive dating to figure out the exact age of a fossil or the exact age of a rock layer. So igneous rocks are full of radioactive particles which decay at a rate called half-life. Half-life is the time that it takes for half of the atoms in a radioactive sample to break down. Different elements have different half-lives. If we think back to our chemistry unit when we talk about all the different elements on the periodic table, that's what we're referring to here. So uranium and carbon-14, which is essentially just a carbon atom with a different number of um, neutrons, it's not super relevant to us right now, but uranium and carbon-14 are two of the most commonly used date rocks because they have very long half-lives. So carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. Uranium has a half-life of 704 million years. So if we find a rock sample and it's made up of carbon-14 and half of the carbon-14 atoms have broken down, then we know that that carbon atom is 5,000, or that sample of rock is 5,730 years old. If only 25% of the carbon-14 atoms are left, that means it had one half-life to 50%, had a second half-life, so now only 25% is left, then we know that that rock sample is 5,730 times two years old, um, which is like 11,000 something, right? So scientists are able to use half-life and radioactive dating to determine the exact age of a rock sample and the fossils in that rock sample. Um, and then again, scientists just use this information to determine how long ago whatever specific rock they are looking at formed. Okay, so that is the end of our understanding geologic history notes. Um, you're going to need all of this information in order to help you with your assignments for this week. I will say the only assignment that has absolute dating, radioactive dating on it, is the rock detective worksheet. Um, I think the last two questions are related to half-life of carbon-14, the 5,730 years. If you are confused about that, just post underneath the assignment on Google Classroom. Um, your friends might be able to help you. You can also email me or send me a remind message and I would be happy to help you with that. Okay, have fun on your assignments.